Uh, this talk actually isn't about ES6. It has a, a vague title that seems to have misled even the conference organizers, which is great, uh, which is exactly what I was shooting for. So, so this is a talk actually about the future uh, and about our hopes for the future. So personally, hmm, when I think of my ideal future, it, it ends up looking something like, like this, right? But I'm sad to report that our progress on space travel and blaster cannons and moon-sized space stations seems a bit slow. So, so yeah, we might not be getting Star Wars, no, no lightsabers, no starfighters, no droids. But one thing we do know is going to be an important part of our, our future is computers. And, uh, you know, sticking with the sci-fi theme, the most recent set of sci-fi books I read was this trilogy called the Singularity Trilogy. Uh, and they're essentially about uh, the emergence of artificial intelligence. And they give a very believable narration of the near future, uh, of a scenario in which this emerges. Uh, you know, from a large corporation building an email software to an analyzer where it's just the usual stuff. Uh, so what struck me as a web developer was how each of these books, taking place as they do in the near future, depicted our relationship to technology. And in particular, you know, going, going one by one, the first takes place in a world with traditional computers as the focus, right? Uh, we have a workplace with servers and data centers and PCs, you know, the beige boxes of you know, most of our lives. But by the time of the second novel, you know, smartphones ended up being the primary computers everyone uses. You know, they're highly personal, they're individual devices, and they're meant for near constant use. And, and of course, by the third novel, it's all implants and cyborgs, and you can ask me about that after the talk. Um, so let's see if I've got this right, this technology stuff. Uh, enhance. All right, sweet. So zooming in on that, right? Because right now, we're caught up in that transition from the first model to the second model, right? The first model mode of interaction with our, our beige boxes to our much more intensely personal devices in smartphones. And, and so that's a lot more personal, really, than the personal computer, right? We carry them with us everywhere, and people, especially the young people, right, kids of today, teens and so on, they're using smartphones from birth, right? They're, they're, that's how they interact with the electronic world. They're not used to this crazy operating system thing. So what I claim is that we're actually headed towards a world where this is the only way that you'll be interacting with a computer. The smartphone will be the device. And as software developers, you might kind of shrug that off. You might think that's unrealistic. You know, you really want your command lines and text editors and file systems and so on. But I, I think that that's actually a view that's pretty unrealistic, right? So right now I'm presenting on a device that's a pretty clear embodiment of this transition um, from uh, desktop to mobile, right? And it's essentially a tablet, but I end up doing all of my work on it. it I haven't opened my proper laptop in months, six months. And I can easily dock it with a multi-monitor setup, full mouse and keyboard, all of that. And from here, it's a pretty small step to a world where what I'm docking is not a tablet, but a smartphone. You know, I, I, this is our mobile future. Now, the problem is that we, as web developers and JavaScript developers, you know, the people in this room, we're not ready for it. Okay, and to understand what I mean by that, to understand how truly behind we all are, we need to go back to the past, to 2010, in fact. So 2010, unfortunately, did not give us space travel, um, but it did give us an app for sharing digitally filtered photos. Almost as good, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously talking about Instagram. You know, Instagram. Uh, in 2010, this Instagram app launched, and it launched on a single closed platform. Now, over the next two years, it gained over 100 million active users before being acquired by Facebook for $1 billion. Only a half a year after that did they finally release a web app. Instagram's main purpose was sharing photos and commenting on them. If this isn't a perfect fit for the open web platform, I don't know what is. And yet, the developers of this app decided to plant it squarely within Apple's walled garden without even an ABI to speak of. So how did things go so wrong? Well, you know, I'm here to convince you that the web is important and that web apps are important. And there's a number of reasons for this. The first is that the web is the only application platform built 
completely on open, free, blue license standards with multiple competing and interoperating implementations uh, it works on every platform, every CPU architecture, and for every user. That's not true of the proprietary platforms that are gaining market share. It's the only platform designed from the ground up to run untrusted user code downloaded over the internet without any fear that that code will harm you or invade your privacy. Just yesterday, Ian Hickson, the editor of the HTML standard, said on a mailing list, the point of the web is there is no installation step. This is a feature, and this is unique among all platforms. Finally, it's the only platform where you, as the developer, are in complete control of your app without having to submit it for oversight to an approval committee or to wait five days to push out an update. But these arguments don't sway large companies or, or startups, right? They just want to make the best app that's possible for their users like Instagram did. And for this, native apps are where it's at. If you want a truly first-class mobile experience, you're going to need to write Objective-C or Java or C-sharp. And even if you want to write JavaScript, just because it's your favorite language, or you know, maybe it is, uh, you aren't going to be writing an app that exists on the open web. You're going to be writing something in JavaScript and HTML, and then packaging it up with Visual Studio or PhoneGap or one of those things. And then you're going to be submitting it to a curated, uh, controlled app store. So given the future we're heading towards, the mobile future, the smartphone-only future, what this means is that the web as a platform, just because it can't keep up, is in danger of dying. And I'm not ready to let that happen. So of course, the rest of this quote from Mark Zuckerberg is often omitted. And it gives some context and some hope that you might otherwise miss. Uh, Mark is saying that if the web platform can catch up, if we can get there, right, he's excited about it long term. And he's excited especially about the momentum that the web already has, the market share, the users, the people using it. These are people you simply can't reach via a walled garden. Not everyone's willing to go through their app, that particular app store. So how do we get there? How do we get to this place that Mark's talking about? How do we maintain momentum and not let it slip away? So what kind of future are we even aiming for? Like, what, what, is, what is the point here? Well, the future of web apps is that everything you want to use has a URL, everything. You want to use email, you visit your email site. You want to use Twitter, you visit Twitter. You want to browse photos, visit Instagram. You want to watch movies, visit Netflix. Any of these apps can take place via a URL. Now sometimes, you might want to grant special privileges to that URL you visit. You might want to allow the apps the ability to interrupt you uh, and send you push notifications. Or you might want to let it run in the background when you're not actually having that tab open and use your phone's battery to synchronize data. Or you might want to give it access to lower levels of your hardware, like raw sockets or gobs and gobs of storage to store movies offline. Or the ability to make phone calls. In those cases, all you do is you bookmark the app to your home screen. And that's it. There is no, there is no step three. What's important here is the steps that you don't see. There's no app store. There's no installation step required before you can use the app. There's no package format. There's nobody hosting your app on their servers and deciding whether it's allowed there. And there's no middleman taking 30% of your purchases. There's nobody saying that your app isn't family friendly enough or that it isn't differentiated enough. There's just the web. So how do we get there? How do we get to a place where that vision can be a reality? Uh, we need to level the web platform up pretty seriously to achieve this kind of parity. People like Facebook or Instagram, or you, can't build web apps that can compete on, the, on this level until you have the tools to do so. So we need, to, we need to build a platform that can delight our users and our investors. And so this is the final frontier that we, as web developers, need to explore. So what is left to achieve parity with native apps? So for me, this breaks down into three skill trees along which we have to level up the web. Right? User engagement, user experience, and the developer experience. And I want to go into depth on each of these, what's missing and how we're solving it. Now I have to pause and remind you that this is a talk about the future, as I said. Not all these things are available right now, or at least not widely available on the mobile platforms of today. But the purpose of this talk is to get you all looking towards the future, to enlist you as partners in this voyage towards the frontier. So let's start with user engagement. 
right? The number one reason people aren't developing web apps is they simply aren't as sticky as native apps. They can't engage the user's attention and keep it in the same way. And there's a number of reasons why web apps are so deficient in this. And the first, the most obvious, is offline. Some of the most engaging web apps, the most engaging apps I use on my phone are the ones I turn to when I don't have an internet or when I don't want real-time data. Things like Instapaper or an RSS reader or eBooks, even videos I've cached offline. You know, apps that normally deal with online data, even, even like email, are much more engaging when you can take them offline. You know, you read your email on the train after having it download all morning. In all these cases, you know, if we want the web platform to support such apps, we need to be able to go to those URLs even if we're offline. We, need, we can't just fail with no internet and that's, that's it. You know, those URLs don't work. Right? We need some way of gracefully degrading and saying, you can launch the app via that URL or that home screen bookmark and it still works against local data without failing the moment the internet goes out. So the solution for this is really pretty cool. It's, uh, it's really technically innovative. It's called Service Worker, and it's, it's making its way and like, actively being worked on by the Chrome and Firefox teams right now in their nightlies. Uh, what it essentially is is a web worker that lies between your application code and the network layer and intercepts all requests and gives you a chance to respond. So for that way, you could, for example, when, somebody, when your app fetches the article's text from the internet from your app's API, you could say, oh, well, wait, we're offline, so let me grab that from local storage. Let me grab that from the file system. Let me grab that from IndexedDB. And you can do all sorts of things like this. You can have fallback scenarios. You can have offline first where it gives you the article's text and then updates it when, when the internet comes back. All those types of things. Another cool thing about service workers is that since they run in a background thread, they don't necessarily need to be alive at the exact same time as your app. So for example, with the upcoming task scheduler API, you could set a timer to start up a function inside the service worker uh, in, with every 30 minutes. This could, for example, download the latest news feeds, you know, ensuring that whenever the user next opens your app, they have, they have fresh and engaging content, no matter if they're online or offline. Or, of course, you could use this technology to uh, remind them that it's been a whole day since they fed their computerized triceratops. Uh, the choice is yours. Um, perhaps, of course, the most important thing for bringing users back to your app is real-time content pushed from the server. And we already have the notification API in browsers for those little toasts, right? You may have seen those in things like IRC Cloud or Gmail. But for things like chat, mes chat messages or breaking news or tweet replies or new emails, all these things need some way of not only happening when your app is open, but also when your app is closed. And by registering a service worker for your app and combining it with a new push API, what you'll be able to do is have that service worker start up in response to events pushed from a push server. And it can then take action. It can pop up a toast. It can download the email so that next time it's available. It can perform some kind of background processing. And finally, the last piece of user experience that we really need to get on top of is payment. And this, I think, is really cool because it's the Achilles heel of the walled gardens. They demand their cut of the in-app payments. And so because we're on the open web and we don't, we can beat them at their own game. We just need to make it easy for users to pay us. And the answer for this is a, is a relatively new and somewhat quirky API called Request Autocomplete. It takes advantage of the fact that we all have payment forms built into our website and makes filling out those payment forms a literally one-click process. You enter your credit card information into your browser and now a website can request that those forms get autocompleted with one click without even showing the form, really. Uh, and so you no longer need to type in credit card numbers or create accounts just to buy things on the internet. It's the same kind of seamless experience you get buying things in native apps with in-app purchases, but it's all mediated through the normal payment transactions and not through a central processor like those you know, curators of your apps. And there's no 30% tithe, of course. It's just normal payment, you know, credit cards. All right, so that's it for user engagement. Um, but it, of course, it's not enough for our apps to be just engaging, right? They just can't, they can't be constantly trying to engage you if they're not fun to use as well. So the second skill tree we need to level our users up across uh, and level the web up across is, is a bunch of little things, but they add up. Things like speed, right? The number one complaint against web apps is still speed. And this comes from a lot of bullshit legacy decisions, things like the dreaded 300 milliseconds touch display 
or blocking layout preventing smooth scrolling, or initial load time being too long, or garbage collection pauses. And so, I mean, this, this seems pretty bad because a lot of these are built into our platform at a, at a deep level. You know, it's a garbage collected language. What are you going to do? Uh, but when I talk to browser vendors about this, I feel a lot more optimistic. What they say is that there's just so much low-hanging fruit, they're just getting started. Uh, there's, there's, you know, JS, they've spent a lot of time optimizing. You know JS is pretty darn fast. Uh, it's one of the best dynamic languages in that respect. But the DOM and, and all its friends, they haven't really touched it yet. They're just starting to dive into making that a fast rendering platform on the same level as native apps. Uh, Mozilla has an experimental browser engine called Servo that they're developing that is designed from the ground up to be parallelizable, to take maximum advantage of your multi-threading in your, in your cores, in your computers, and your phones, to parallelize layout processing. So that'll be pretty excellent. Um, the Blink team, you know, the part of Chrome, is, is the number one goal for 2000 theme, 2014 is improving mobile performance. You know, somewhat, it gets mocked sometimes because they're like, how does this help mobile performance? Well, uh, I don't know. But that, that's really what they're all about. Um, and of course, there's, there's really kind of crazy left field technologies like Asm.js from Mozilla that, well, it's a completely novel approach. You compile native code down to JavaScript and it takes place within a fixed size memory buffer. And this allows you to do things like Unreal Engine games compiled down to JavaScript from C and C++. And they can run on your phone at 60 frames per second with no garbage collection pauses because there is no garbage collection. It's all in a fixed size memory buffer. So on speed, I think things are looking up. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's important. It's prioritized and it's being done. You know, another thing that we can do a lot more about as web developers is responsiveness. You, know, it's, it's, you need to understand and sense the user's environment. And, and that's part of the, pretty much the best part of web apps, right? You don't have a tablet version of your app and a, a mobile version of your app. You just have one app. It's responsive, it's cross-platform, it's cross-device. You know, it works just as well on your phone as when you use it on your tablet or when you dock your phone with your tablet or with your docking station and your three monitors you know, or your Google Glass. It'll all work because that's the technology we have in web apps. And if we as developers spend enough time, we can make it work in that exact way. So the tools are already there, but we just need to make sure we take advantage of them. And we're also going to need to straighten out our data storage story. This is kind of a thing I've personally been looking at a lot. Uh, if you think about it, you know, we, we have these prompts that come up whenever you try and use like 10 megabytes of storage. And that's kind of ridiculous. Uh, you know, a native app can use a lot more than that. The real problem is that you don't want a website taking over all the storage. And the solution to that is something uh, quite a bit different. Like you let websites take up storage, but you base that on how often they're interacted with. Or you let them take up storage, and then you start evicting that storage uh, as the user needs it. You know, that type of thing. You need a different model. It isn't like, oh, every 10 megabytes, let's pop up a new permission dialogue and get in the way of the user. And this ties into offline support, of course, because without a good storage model, storing things offline is not going to be very feasible. So Service Worker does solve this a bit. It has a transparent set of caching APIs and abstractions that make it easy to store data from an HTTP server locally for offline use. Finally, to be truly first class in the user experience side, we need to be able to integrate with your device just as well as native apps. So we need to be able to have access to the notification center. We need to make it into the task switcher. And we need to show up on the home screen. These types of things. You know, presumably much of this would be gated on a bookmarking step. For example, once a URL has been bookmarked to the home screen, that's a signal that the user wants to treat this as a first class entry in their task switcher, that it wants to give access to the notification center and he wants to have you know, its own set of managed privacy controls. But without this kind of integration, web apps will always be second class citizens. And that's, of course, exactly what we're working to avoid. So the last skill tree the web needs to level up on is simultaneously both the least important, right, because it's not about our users, but the most important as well, because that's how we attract people to build apps for the web. So it needs to get better for you. It needs to be pleasant, productive, and fun to code in for us developers. And there's a lot of things we're doing in this regard. So better base primitives are a large part of the push these days. You know, things like language features, like promises or async functions or class syntax, are certainly going to make it a more pleasant language to code in. Um, but you know, bridging the gap, you have things like the combination of mutation observers on the DOM side and object.observe on the JavaScript side 
will give you seamless data binding between JavaScript objects and DOM elements. And there's also things being developed in the DOM space like bedrock technologies, like custom elements or shadow DOM, which gives you better encapsulation and a better ability to express your intent. And things like web crypto, you know, will give you strong access to cryptography primitives, you know, things that were just missing from our platform and you might have had to write in JavaScript. And I, I really don't think it's a good idea for us to try and write OpenSSL in JavaScript because that worked out so well in C++. So, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, and finally, you know, things like the Web Animation API are another fun example because what they do is they take what was previously locked up in CSS and they give you pro programmatic control over it and give you this access, to, direct access to the animation graph. So we're doing a lot of this sort of stuff, unearthing the primitives, and this is like a big part of the extensible web philosophy, which I'm sure we'll hear more about at this conference. But it's not just browser implementers and spec editors who are leveling up the web. It's, it's also you know, application developers and framework developers. You know, frameworks these days give pretty impressive productivity. You know, things like Angular where they're saying HTML enhanced for web apps, right? That's, that's really where we need to be if we're going to not be, you know, tearing our hair out every time we want to have a thing update, you know, with data binding. And especially something like Ember, which is historically coming from Cocoa, you know, a pretty well battle-tested set of APIs used on the Apple platforms. And to me, this idea of looking to other platforms and seeing what makes them pleasant for developers to use and building similar tools in the web sphere is a no-brainer. And you know, speaking of no-brainers, what about CSS Flexbox, right? You know, duh, let's have the ability to vertically center things. Seems good. Um, and you know, more importantly, right, CSS grid layout, the ability to say, I want to actually express my layout in the same way that my designers do and in the same way that everything like, actually makes sense. You know, finally, this will be able to do our layout sanely without horrible hacks like clear fix or display none or absolutely positioning everything or just wanting to die. Um, so, and, and I do want to point out there's some interesting explanation, explorations of other systems taking place, not as much in the standard space, but in the library space. Um, and these might be better suited for app development, I'm not sure yet, but things like grid style sheets and various constraint-based layout systems, largely based on cassowary which comes again from Mac OS and their constraint layout solver. Um, and there's also some thoughts, you know, this is this still very early stage, of entirely decoupling the render tree and the DOM tree, saying that we don't need a one-to-one -one correspondence between these markup elements and what get rendered on the screen. We need to think about the render tree as its own separate entity. And of course, we have to give developers what they really want, which is just more raw power to affect and read the physical world. So things like battery status or network connection info or protocols like NFC or Bluetooth or USB so you can build your robots that are controlled by your computer phone or raw TCP and UDP sockets so you can go talk to your printer or form peer-to-peer -peer networks or that type of thing. Play games, right? And this is an ongoing effort. So, for example, things like geolocation have just been built into the platform for a while, but geofencing isn't there yet. And something like orientation locking is still being spec, even though everybody knows this is probably the simplest API we could possibly think of. You know, not, not to disparage those people, but uh, you know, Mozilla has been really leading the charge here with Firefox OS, uh, but a lot of that work is premature. It's rushed out just to be able to ship a platform, and it's predicated on a packaged app model instead of an open web model. So there's still a lot of work to do, and we're doing a lot of that. So that's it. Um, that's how we're leveling up the web exploring that final frontier of mobile parity. And I know I didn't go into great depth on a lot of these things. You know, I'd love to do so, so please catch me throughout the conference. Um, but this is the sort of stuff that I and others will be working on over the coming years, and I hope you'll join me. Uh, and in case all that was a little too abstract, let me leave you with a clear and simple message before I go. So the open web platform is under existential threat from closed proprietary ecosystems and their gatekeepers. We may have momentum for now, but especially with this transition to mobile, we're falling behind. And those gatekeepers are wasting no time to scoop in and, and get our users, right? They want to put users behind their walled gardens and in their silos where they can control the content people see and take away their 30% tithe of any commerce that takes place within their sphere. So the web isn't perfect, but this great community this you, me, browser implementers, spec editors, framework authors, all of us, we're all doing our best to bring it into the future where it needs to be. 
And we're doing it as part of this open and collaborative process that has always guided the web's evolution. So thank you. <laughs>